we are going to call a meeting to order at 6.58. I didn't think about it until this very minute, but thank you. Yeah, and no one else was scheduled. That's true. But anyway. Okay. Um, I did distribute minute, minutes that Jack put together from the May 14th meeting. He will note that I made a couple of changes before I sent them out. Do I have a motion to approve them? No. Um, it also needs to be noted that my name was left off of those present. Mm -hmm. Well, we can have a motion and then we can discuss it and we can make changes. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, Sylvia. What were some of the other changes? Just If you need me to go back, well, it was actually a Google form, so it's easy enough to change. But I didn't change them there. I changed them on mine, so I will make the changes and right. then distribute the final version. All right. Okay, there is a motion. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. And we have one correction to make. Are there any other changes? In that case, do I have a vote? All in favor? I'm thinking this should be four in favor and one abstention, perhaps. Okay. Thank you. We do. Technically, Julie is a member of the public here this evening, um, but we do not have other public members to comment. And so we move on to welcome to the new person and the perspective in person. Thank you. Um, do you want to just name them for the minutes? Yes. We have Wayne Abercrombie and Julie Rose. Okay. And then the applicant for the open trustee position. Julie, do you want to say anything? Uh, I'm just interested and pleased to be here and looking forward to hopefully working with everybody. And uh, I've been trying to update myself with the minutes and um, the library trustees handbook and all the other material that you've sent us. So um, hopefully the select board will look on me kindly. And I will be joining you. Can I ask you, Wayne, why you decided to mount a write-in campaign? Because clearly, more than just you voted for you. My father-in-law, who lives with us, decided to ask me if I would like to serve the library <laughs> because he's voting in the election and he would be happy to vote for me. <laughs> and in an off-kilter moment, I said yes. <laughs> I think I got six votes for somebody. He must have. He has a coffee group, and I think he lobbied with them for me. Did you vote for yourself? I don't think I did. Oh. I, <laughs> I can't. I can't remember, but I did consider it. Yeah, I considered it seriously. I mean, when, once he suggested it, I said yes. I would. I'd be interested. In oh, I didn't mean to sound flip about no, that. No, no. Well, it was sort of flippant the way I responded. But. Yeah. Okay. Um, I distributed to everyone the official form that Julie filled out as well as her brief statement. If there is not any more discussion or questions for Julie, I would entertain a motion to recommend that she be appointed to the post of library trustee for the current year. Thank you. Second? Second. Is there any further discussion? And this would be decided tomorrow evening at the select board meeting? Is that correct? Yes, I am. Okay. All in favor? Wayne, you can vote. Yes. Okay. Anyone opposed? No. In that case, you have at least our endorsement. Half there. Thank you. And I will 
forward that to town hall when I get home tonight, and that will be on their agenda. It is on their agenda, but then they will have our right. recommendation and vote as well. I, I just want to say that as someone who's been a trustee for a really long time, um, <laughs> it's so wonderful that we have these two like vacancies and we were really worried about them and then we were trying so hard to like recruit and then two people came and stepped up because I think the more new voices that we have on the board and the varied voices, the better it is. So I just really want to acknowledge both of you because sure. I think we were worried, right? Like, and then it was oh, like, like no one could get sick or go away and miss a meeting. And then two, and, and you know, two people that were ex, you know kind of excited about joining us, and I, I'm really happy about that. But I think an assist goes out to the town clerk for doing a little bit of nice. matchmaking. matchmaking. <laughs> nice. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. okay. Patrick, you have the floor. Mm. So for the, for the benefit of the new folks, I will just say that um, I, you did receive the report. I did. I assume, and, and the things that go along with it. Um, so generally what I do uh, these days is just sort of go over the highlights mention things that are uh, noteworthy and mostly focus on the things that for me I'm looking for action from the trustees on um, and but by all means if you have any questions if there's anything that I'm saying here or anything that was that was sent around please you know please feel free to ask um, so uh, I just want to mention that um, you just for context you you may or may not know about the accident where a vehicle hit the wall of the of the building uh maybe two two months ago and uh, so we're still in the process of figuring out how that's going to be fully restored it's a, you know it's a minor it's a minor seemingly a minor thing but but the way the building is constructed there are a lot of things that are connected to other things and so it's not a simple fix of just kind of like pushing it back out um, so it's kind of an ongoing, an ongoing thing, and that there are engineers that are going to be enlisted to look at it and come up with the best solution. So that's uh, I don't really have a, a, an update on when that work will be completed, but it is underway, uh, and there will be some some period of time where that room has to be closed to the public. It's a very popular room, and a lot of people, you know, families come in to use it throughout the day because it's it's more or less always open and available to the to to the public to use. I assume you've been assured that there's no danger right now that, that it's structurally fine. Yes, it's it's fine and, and the area that, that, that is affected they've taken the drywall off so that they can see you know they can see the structure within um, and it's covered over and we have some stuff in front of it so that you know you can't really get near it. Um, so that is happening. We're having a meeting on the Thursday the 13th, I, the time keeps switching around. The time that we were supposed to meet has now gone up in the air. We're supposed to have a, meet, a meeting with the town administrator and some members of the DPW um, building maintenance team and the, uh, the head of DPW to discuss a change to the, the custodial staffing. Currently, we have uh, a member of the DPW department who's doing custodial work and we're asking for a change back to a prior arrangement when we had a, a cleaning service that that worked for the town, essentially cleaned all of the town buildings. Um, she still cleans um, a number of the town buildings, um, but in the, in the past year, the change was made and we ended up with a custodian from DPW who serves us and the Council on Aging. But we've asked that we go back to the prior arrangement because the custodian will there were certain things that were not getting done under the new regime that were being done previously so we just asked if we can switch it back to the way it was um, and so we're going to be meeting about that sometime this week hopefully to make that uh, to, to get that in place hopefully for July 1st um, that's that's something we've been talking about for a little while so I'm, I'm hopeful that we will get that resolved um, library of things was was soft launch, I say, uh, out into the world. Uh, we've got a system in place and you know we have some items. The Library of Things is a collection of sort of non-traditional library items 
useful items. Can you give some examples? Some examples are um, musical instruments we have. So right now it's a very small collection because we just wanted to get it off the ground and have a, a system in place that we could then you know, grow from. So right now there are some musical instruments. There are ukuleles, there's a guitar. We have some things like a, um, a kilowatt meter, which you plug into a wall and then you can plug in an appliance or something that in your household into to track how much energy it's actually consuming. Um, we have um, some like, like a USB microphone. So if you want to track podcasting or you want to record music on a laptop, you can, you can borrow that. So things like that and we'll be listening to community feedback to see what kinds of things people would like us to be offering and then we'll try to expand the collection in those ways. Mm -hmm. But we, we wanted to start small and just sort of see what the demand was like and how it's going to work. Another thing that we're going to be adding is um, some, uh, some Wi-Fi wireless hotspots to the collection because there's a lot of demand for that and that's something that uh, libraries are offering. Um, so we're, gonna, we're working with the fire department to the fire department administers the, uh, they handle all the billing for T, they have a T-Mobile contract or account. Um, and so we're going to try to use piggyback on their, on their billing to, you know, add the, the hotspots to them. And then we'll just pay for the, you know, pay for those monthly through the fire department. So we're, we're working those details out now. So Patrick, uh, if yeah. um, a client comes in and wants to see what's available in the library of things, where in the library would they look? So you would come to the front desk. We have the, um, we have all of the items in a, in a binder. So currently, that's the way we're doing it. We have, they, they are they do circulate through through Evergreen, which is the library software that we circulate all of the books and everything else through. They're there, but there's no descriptive material. One of the problems with the with a project like this is that with a bunch of non-traditional items, you have to either create a bunch of new records um, for things that aren't necessarily meant to be cataloged with a, you know the li you know library <coughs> formats. Um, so rather than have that be sort of a choke point where things would always get slowed down, we wanted to be able to add things quickly. So we have like something that's fairly non-descriptive that works for us administratively to track where things go, but they're not so useful for the public to be able to see in the catalog what those things are. So it's more, because this is really more focused towards the local, this isn't something that, that we're gonna send things out to another community. They have to be borrowed here, they have to be returned here. So we feel like it's not inappropriate for the items to be browsed here. If you want to come in and see what's in the collection, I mean, you can also call and you know, there are other ways to communicate. When the new website goes live, there will be a page for this that includes, you know, that shows all of these items. And so at that point, it'll be more, um, the, somebody's walking into the library. There will be um, more descriptive information. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to pull the pinout since we're having that we're prompt. Oh, no, it's not a problem anymore. Well, I just closed it because of the road rules. When I can't roll it into the slot. There isn't anybody else who will be coming, so I don't think. Wait, I closed it because it was so noisy outside. Oh, you don't want it there. There isn't anyone else who's coming, or if they do, they can knock, and someone will see them. So he's talking about a connection for things that regular Wi-Fi does not support, is that right? No, a hotspot is like if you're going somewhere that doesn't have internet, you can plug in and get internet. So for instance, um, if you were only hiking and you like wanted to take your, for some reason, your laptop with you <laughs> to do some work in the woods. <laughs> You could you you could plug it in, and it's a place where there wouldn't be Wi-Fi. Yeah, is what it does. So how does the library use that? No, we're giving they're loaning them out to people. I we would loan device. out a device. It's a device that people okay. would. It's a physical. Use. That's what I, I mean. Think. Theoretically, you can sometimes use your phone as a hotspot if you plug in something else. Mm -hmm. If you're connected, this is a device that allows someone who may not have internet at their home or wherever they're going. Uh, just to, so Patrick, with any of these library of things items, are there any risks involved? Is there any waiver that the library would need to consider? 
risks in terms of liability. Um, we're kind of making a, that is a good question. We're, we're kind of making a, a determination not to loan things that are, we're not gonna be loaning out like power saws and things like that, <laughs> anything like that. that um, but as far as it goes, I don't know that we, we would need to be covered beyond anything that we hand, you know, hand out now that might break your toe if you dropped it on yourself. I don't know. So the Leverett Library works in conjunction with the Friends of Leverett Pond to loan mm -hmm. out kayaks. Okay. And yeah. before you can take a kayak out, you have to sign a waiver. Yes. If we were to go in the, the direction of something that had implicit risk, we would probably be talking about that. But at this point, what we're loaning out is are, are things that um, it, it would be hard to conceive of a way that you, okay. you know, that So still no chainsaws? <laughs> not yet. No, no. Not right now. Unless that's what the community wants. If the community wants, then we, you know, we explore what, I mean, I'm being facetious, but if the, if the community wanted things like kayaks, if they wanted things like you know, whatever, you know, something like that. We would have to, we'd have to talk about it. We'd have to talk to town council. We'd have to figure out what, what would be involved in that. I would think in that case, we could get together with friends of like Lake Warner. Mm -hmm. Like if we wanted kayaks, that's a good natural it is. A good connecting point. They, they have. Yes. And then it may be decided that it's just too risky to do that. But it's interesting to see some other mm -hmm. local communities yeah trying some of the riskier items. Yeah, and the nice, yeah, and that's exactly right. I mean, the nice thing about this is that so many other libraries are doing this that rarely, I mean, just this library, we're, we're actually slow getting to the library of things. So, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel. A lot of this has already been sort of figured out elsewhere, what works and what doesn't, so. Can I yeah. ask you an unrelated question about the item before, and it's really just, my personal curiosity yes. about oh, yeah. the door counter. Sure. Yep. Like, is it because if you walk over it, like, how come it doesn't work? Um, Do you know? Or I don't, like and, and I, I only have I only have guesses, and some of those guesses are that so the, the this library door counter is mounted on either side of the door frame at the front entrance, and it's basically a, a light beam. When the beam is interrupted, it just ticks another number. So, my the problem, the problem that we're experiencing is that um, the way we count normally is someone comes through, through the door and we put down a hash mark. And we put down whether it's an adult, a young adult, a child, we track phone calls as well. Um, first of all, the counter can't differentiate, which doesn't really matter because really what we wanted to know was whether we were undercounting the kind of gross amount of people coming into the building, which we were fairly sure that we were by hand because the busier we get and the more that we're running around, the more that we're missing putting people down and we have to guess. Um, so we put this up and my theory is that, you know, the way people enter and exit the building, sometimes they enter and exit in groups, particularly adults and children. So a parent coming in holding a child or um, a parent coming in pushing a stroller, we're not really sure how how the interruption of the beam works. Like if it if it's if it's being interrupted for if if I stand in front of the beam, does the counter just keep going up or does it just count one? All we know is that it's un, it's dramatically undercounting what we know to be true because we're counting it by hand. If anything, we're undercounting at the desk, not overcounting, mm -hmm. and that is that is undercounting even more. So we decided it wasn't in its current. Huh. So does the door counter? automatically assume that people are going to be counted twice going in? So it gives you two numbers. It gives you an in number and an out number. Um, somehow, I'm not sure how it, I'm not sure how it knows the direction, but somehow it does and it gives you two numbers and generally they're, they're relatively close to each other, but then again, sometimes they're not. And so they're just, we, we were getting like wild numbers that just really weren't useful to us because really the bottom line here, the reason that we're doing this is not, um, is not because we're, I mean, we're curious, but the, the bottom line is that we want to be able to give the most accurate information when we go to the select board or the finance committee to say, this is how busy we are, and we've countered it this way, and we've countered it this way, and this is the most accurate picture that we can give you of how, how active we are and how much this department is used, so that if we have to ask, for instance, for another staff position, that we can justify it. And so the, the counter as it was working was just not, was not 
giving us huh. accurate information. So we have to figure out some, some other more accurate uh, device or system to, to, to track that. Wow. But, but even, if, even if it was giving us good numbers, we probably still would not have stopped doing the hand tallies because we, again, we want to be able to differenti differentiate. We want to know if we want to pull it apart, what, when people are coming in, when young adults are coming in, when, when children are coming in, because we sort of like know that stuff in, a, you know, in, in an anecdotal way, but if we want to really get scientific about it, we'd be able to do that. So we will continue to do that in either case. Um, yeah, so does that, that's, that answers that. Um, I wanted to mention the, the lead recycling. Um, we made some, some good progress in the last uh, month or two. Thank you, Jack, for, he, Jack made some, um, made an approach to the town transfer station. One of the things that we were kind of hung up on was that um, we were applying to be a lead certified building. And one of the things that's a requirement of lead certification is that the building uh, be a collection point for certain electronic waste. And so, um, as an example, these are, this is, um, these are from the Irving Public Library, which is also a Johnson Roberts building, same, um, same grant round as, as us, it's a new building. And these are the things that they've collected because they, they got it there a little ahead of us with their lead stuff. Um, but they collect, they collect cell phones and batteries. They collect um, various types of batteries themselves. Uh, and they have, a, and also um, not electronic, but they collect eyeglasses as well. Somehow that, that counted for the, lead, for the re lead requirement. So we're kind of copying them on what is acceptable and what we can get away with. But, but whereas in Irving, as part of the Franklin County Waste District, they have someone there that comes and actually collects the material from them and takes it away and like magic. Um, it wasn't so easy for us to do. We, there was no corresponding uh, authority in Hampshire that we could call on and we tried to figure that out and it just doesn't exist. So we had to kind of figure out how, to, how we were going to do that that didn't necessarily put like a huge burden on the library staff to figure out where we were gonna dump you know, tons of batteries and, and electronic Jump. Um, so there were several possibilities, but we wanted to find something that was going to be long, long term, viable in the long term. You can take things to Staples, but who knows how long Staples will be there? I mean, they could they could say, well, we're closing and we're not there anymore. And then what what do we do? So it seemed like we needed to find something that was more. The transfer station's not going anywhere. You know, the contract may change, but it's you know the transfer station will always be there. And if it's somebody else, another vendor. Well, that you were saying you bring it there. You don't mean like, I thought you were saying like individuals can just bring their stuff there. You're saying the library can it, take gonna, the stuff to the dump. Yes, yeah, at okay. some point we're gonna have to figure out how to get it there, but okay. that's like less of a, that's less of a lift than having to like go to some, you know. Maybe the DPW will help. Perhaps, perhaps. Or the friends of the library, possibly. But I'm just thinking the DPW has truck and like a billet, you know, that have yeah, I mean, hopefully it's not that much. I mean, what we're looking at, so, and to, to this point, what we're looking to do, and this is one of the action items that I have on here, is that um, we looked at, uh, so I got the, the information from Irving, and I asked them, like, what is the receptacle that you use? I believe I sent it around as, an, as part of the PDF, so you can see what they, what they have. I don't have the picture here. Um, but they have a nice, like, triple stacked collection thing that has a door that opens up and then they have little bins inside and each type of material can be collected through a little, little, little cubby hole. Yeah. It's very valuable to see, to see their design. Yes, to and theirs was nice because it doesn't. It has a small footprint. Um, I don't think it looks particularly nice, so it, and it cost, it cost about 1800 bucks for that. Really? Now we could probably we could probably come up with something you know we could come up with something some other homegrown solution I'm I'm quite certain that we could um, but considering that I didn't think it was particularly uh, attractive I reached out to Thayer Street Thayer Street Millwork mm -hmm. um, is that what it's called Millwork mm -hmm. they do all kinds of cabinetry and they've, they've done, done a lot of stuff in the library stuff. like they did that little floating shelf there um, to sort of match the woodwork of. Actually, did they do that podium? They may have done that podium too. I can't remember. They did a whole bunch of stuff for us, like did at the beginning. They retooled the front desk. They, as well. they retooled the yeah. front, the circulation desk, which was um, originally at Smith College. That was from the Smith College Library. It was a much bigger piece of furniture that they cut down 
and refurbished for our purposes. They did a great job on it. So anyway, they're, yeah, they're great to work with and they do a good job. And one of the, um, the big reveals in library furnishing is that oftentimes it was not that much more ex expensive to have something made to your specifications and have it look nice than it was to get something that was just off the off the shelf from the vendor, you know the big vendors. Um, so I reached out to them and asked for a quote, and lo and behold, it was not cheaper. It was far more expensive. It was forty eight hundred dollars. I think I mentioned that here. So we're probably not going to go that route. Um, but I did want to I did want to put it out there just to kind of get feedback on what direction we should go in because there are other I'm sure there are other solutions that we could be looking at something that's not. Um, that's you know less fancy and less expensive. That's more utilitarian. That's um, simple. What What about like um, cabinets, like from the cabinet shop, like you know, Kohl's, like yeah, your yeah. kitchen cabinets. But then you have to get like a handyman willing to like put the cabinet. To like hang it? Do you mean like a hanging cabinet, or what do you mean? No, you can get them built ever how you want, like cabinets, like that kitchen would be cabinets expensive. and everything. That would be expensive. Oh, you think so? What about looking at IKEA? IKEA has some mm -hmm. of furniture. Yeah. They have a shoe bin that stands mm -hmm. um, about that high that is a pull open. Um, mm -hmm. and you are supposed to put shoes in it. Um, yeah, so something like that could, could, could make a lot of sense. So yeah, I think... Um, I think what I will do, because again, even just the idea of spending eighteen hundred dollars for something that I thought—I mean, it, functionally it looked like it would work well, but it was like so expensive for something that was like not particularly attractive. I, it was kind of like hard to swallow. Um, so maybe we can find something that is both more affordable and more attractive. So yeah, so I'll do a little more, do a little more investigating. And if anybody else has any ideas on this, or um, please let me know because I would like to get it sorted out sooner than later so that we can just start you know moving along and check that box and stop thinking about it um, so there is that and then um, I, I guess I'll, I'll go through a couple of these so the, the circulation assistant um, as some of you may or may not know we had hired someone who had a number of um, who had a number of health issues that was making it difficult for them to be, you know, reliable in their attendance. So we decided that we were going to have to go back out and try to find another person to do uh, Saturdays and Wednesday evenings. And so we've got the uh, we have that position advertised, and we're getting a lot of response, and which is a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're currently going through and contacting um, some folks that we think would be a good fit. And hopefully we will be doing some interviews later this week and next week and get that resolved because again, I, I would like this to not, to not draw out and have someone here uh, because we really, need, we really need the help. Even though it's only like a 10 hour position, we really need that help. So that is underway. Native Plantings Project, uh, is more or less complete. We had little one little wrinkle in that there was a um, what is the what is that tree? The red, red bud. bud. Red bud. The red bud uh, drew the uh, the the ire of uh, of the DPW because it is apparently too close to a sewer outlet pipe coming out of the building, um, which I. I, I it, this never it never occurred to me because we already had like very you know some very big type bush type things over there. The so I see this. Yeah, I didn't think this was gonna be an issue. It just never occurred to me. Um, so apparently what we're going to have to do is remove that. And so the 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 uh, the the conservation district is going to take it back and repurpose it in another project. So it's not gonna it won't go to waste and we don't have to figure out another place for it. Um, but they you know they understand the the issues. Yeah. As someone involved in the planting it wasn't that bad to get it. It wasn't that big. Yeah. It wasn't that it wasn't as big as some of the other things that we planted the first time around. So, um, but I do I am sorry that it has to that it has to go. But otherwise, everything um, went very smoothly. We had about um, I didn't actually count, but I would say we probably had close to twenty volunteers. Would you say that's true, Jack? Yes. So we had about twenty people here, and um, 
I was really, I was nervous that we were going to be here all day long with just like a handful of people trying to get it done. And I was so happy that we had that great turnout and we were done beforehand. We were done, done by lunchtime. Mm -hmm. And that was great. Uh, that felt really good. And everybody had a great time. The weather was extremely pleasant to do that kind of work in. And we got everything moved around and... Uh, all the mulch was spread. The whole job was in. Yeah. Yeah. We had some good direction yeah. from Megan and from home. Yeah. So it was a good project, and I'm 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 very happy with it. Some some things look a little droopy right now, but hopefully they <coughs> hopefully they spring back. We'll see. Not, the, not mostly not the new stuff. It's mostly like some of the, the lilies that we transplanted. Some of them are a little a little droopy, but um, but I think they'll they'll they'll, they'll prop back up. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention was the um, oh actually a couple more things. Sorry, the roof and window. Um, we do have a quote from. This is the company that actually did, um, apparently, as I understand it, this glass company worked on the building when it was constructed and they installed the curtain glass, like the curtain windows at either end of the building. So like the big tall windows and the, the curtain glass into the children's room and, and some of the smaller rooms. They did not do these, I don't think they did these windows you know, the operable windows, and they didn't do the clerestory windows. So they were not the, the, apparently they were not the party responsible for doing the poor caulking job on the clerestory windows. Apparently the windows up high do not have appropriate caulking, and, or it, it, it wasn't done right, or it's disintegrating, or something's wrong with it, and um, it, it could be a source of water infiltration into the building. So, um, so Gary Berg, um, did get a quote from that company because they were over here looking at something else. We had a possible water leak on one of the curtain windows that they were trying to figure out where it came from. They didn't. They can't confirm or deny that it happened. I'm still not sure if it wasn't just somebody like left a wet drink on the thing. Who knows? Um, but they gave us the quote. The quote is for five thousand eight hundred and forty-five dollars, and that is to caulk thirty-seven windows up on the roof along the perimeter. And so this this seems to be um, one of those things that we may just have to do uh, because it is it is sort of like within the realm of. Um, is there any recourse to the original installers? I, I, we're the problem with this, like everything else, is that we're so far out of warranty that um, there there really isn't. I think if we had caught it um, earlier, but I don't spend personally. I don't spend a lot of time on the roof. Um, and nothing so far, nothing, I have been on it though, uh, but nothing, since nothing, as far as we know, nothing's been leaking through that source. There was never any reason to be, to be paying attention to it. We, you know, so it wasn't until, um, until I think Gary noticed something or said something or, or Tom Quinlan noticed it. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure. Was there an actual leak? We have had, we've, we had a couple of water stains on that end of the building in the local history room and um, one small one in my office. And we're not sure if that was through the roof or some other source, we, we don't know. Um, we did have a roofer out and the roofer looked at anything that they thought was problematic and, and sh sh to shore it up. Um, and we currently have an engineering firm that's here to evaluate the roof as a whole. So they did sure. some actual repairs. The roofing company. They did. They did. But they can't like tell us 100. percent Well, this was the cause of that water stain. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know. We just have to watch it. The other possibility is that um, around the time that we noticed those stains, there was one of those kind of odd storms where there was a very high wind and hot and um, heavy rain, and it was definitely blowing. So if it was blowing the right direction, it could have been that it blew up under the shingles and somehow made its way down. I don't know how the roof is actually constructed. But that seems like a possibility that it could have been, you know, one of those kind of freakish things that the water just goes the right way and and it's in. Um, but hopefully, hopefully the roof is is stabilized and for the short term, and then in the longer term, that's what the the engineering firm is is supposed to do is to I mean their their goal is to give us a report saying this is what we think of the design and construction of the roof. This is where we think you may have problems. This is, and these are some suggestions about what you may want to do. They may say the roof is fine. They may say the roof is, you know, 
it's good not for the three years or it's good for 20 years or I mean, you, what we might expect, it, we might have expected with a roof like this to get 25 or 30 years out of it, and they may come back and say, you know, all things considered, you're probably not going to get that, but we don't necessarily recommend that you tear it off and start again. Or they might come back and say, this is a horrible roof, and you need to do something, you need to do something now about it before you have further damage. So that's why we called in experts, so that we can rely on them to tell us what is happening um, on the roof, because we have a, a number of different opinions. Um, from folks involved in the project, from, from the building inspector to the owner's project manager to the architect. Everyone has an opinion on this and they don't necessarily all line up. It's the, the underlying reason for this is because <coughs> we initially wanted to install solar panels and yeah. their issues with the roof were identified by the town building inspector and the building manager which precluded our issuing an RFP to have that work done. So we are trying to get to a place where we can have that work done. Meantime, the town has begun looking in a broader picture at a larger solar array to support town operations. And so it's things may have shifted some, but we still feel like we need to know what the condition of the roof is. So that's why that's going forward. Um, I also want to point out that the Lazat estimate is essentially 500, is $158 per window, and it does specify that they are removing the caulk, preparing the window, and then replacing the caulk, which makes it not quite as outrageous as it might look in the end, I guess not outrageous at all. Julie, go ahead. I'm sorry, I don't know if I could ask a question. Of course. Is there a warranty with this new caulking for any period of time? With the new caulking? Yeah, the, 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 this estimate that, you know, the 5,000 and... That is a good question. I would assume that there is, but I will ask that question yeah. to find and out. I'm only laughing because... You have to no. no, I'm laughing because... What about the warranty on the building and the roof, right? right. So, well, we're yeah, still, absolutely. so you'll see as time goes on, we're probably going to have to make a decision about, you know, do we go back to the attorney? Is, is this a build? Like, depending on what happens, if they say the roof is fine for the next, you know, we may do nothing. We may find out that the roof was built, was a faulty build, and we may have to have an attorney. Like, mm -hmm. we don't know. Well, and and I, should, I should things. say that um, just so that, that you know, you both are aware, and anyone listening to this is aware, we did go to town council with this to discuss the possibility of trying to recourse. find recourse on this issue because we were out of warranty, but there was clearly something, wrong. something was wrong. Um, and we did, we did explore that. We sent a lot of documents to town council and Ultimately, what town council recommended, or what they what they said was, they didn't they couldn't really fully recommend this course of action because the cost to prepare a case, the amount of people that you would have to employ, expert witnesses and engineers, etc., um, the fact that you apparently could not recoup claim that you couldn't recoup those costs if you did win, and if you didn't when yeah. you'd be out that money plus yeah. you'd still need to do whatever you needed to do with the roof so they just sort of said it was not necessarily a good use of time or money to to go that route and um, at one point we did have a have a quote for a partial replacement of the roof to go from asphalt as it is now to a metal roof which is what it was intended mm -hmm. to be um, in order to put the solar panels on the metal roof and not have to worry about it uh, and it was, it was, I can't remember the number now because it was several years ago, but it was between two and three hundred thousand dollars, I think, to have that work, work done on part of the roof, not the whole roof, just the part that would be supporting the solar panels. And um, so it's a, it's a good, it's a good amount of money. So the, the legal thing, just kind of like if, it, and the, the lawyer said it could be as much as a hundred thousand dollars to litigate this for something where you could only, you're only talking about recouping two hundred 
or 300,000. So it just wasn't a, the math didn't really make sense to, to them. But going forward on this caulking, you know, just to find out Absolutely. if they have a yes. warranty on, yes. with, on that kind of work. Absolutely, yes. When was the building built? It was completed in 20, the end of 2020. We occupied it in uh, November 1st, 2020. Or either that, it was it was Halloween 2020. It was one of those two dates. It was one of those two dates because I was here. <laughs> It's yeah. four years old, yes. Yeah. But the warranty was two, two years, and wow. so we're out of warranty. So anything we've discovered is sort of, we're sort of on our own. And originally, in, from someone who has served on the building committee, mm -hmm. we really had pushed for a metal roof, but it was very expensive at the time, and the, the budget just didn't allow for it. And we are looking at other options of solar and, and different buildings, including the senior center, which has a metal roof, and including um, the old town landfill that's all capped off, possibly installing a larger array there. None of those things move very quickly, but that's the hope. Yeah. For some reason, I'm, I'm really aware these days of the cost of doing business any kind of repairs, any kind of, it seems to have skyrocketed. I, I, mm -hmm. uh, economist, I haven't studied the figures, but everything is up astronomically. Um, and it's hard to get people to do the work. Right. Exactly. That's the other part. So it is a scarcity problem, and that, that drives prices up, unfortunately. But uh, especially for big projects like this, because people have to be qualified to do, to take on something of this scale. So. Yes, but with something like this, with the caulking, all of these things, yes. Their costs are going up. It's yep. just yep. Do we need to look at appropriating funding for this? Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a motion to fund the fix by Lazard. Sir? I'd like to make a motion to for the library to fund the fix by Lazard and um, do we have money in the building? Like on the, can, do we still have construction money? Is that what we should take it out of? I guess I'll make that my motion and yeah. we can change it. That would, that would <laughs> make sense. Yes, yeah. I would say yes. That because this was one of those things that, uh, I mean, I spoke to Linda Sanderson about this specifically because we had been um, paying for certain other things, furnishings and things out of remaining money. And she said, well, should we be you know, using that money for you know, for important things, and I said, well, we have we have money in this bucket, and we have money in this bucket, and it's there they can be used interchangeably. But that seemed to be her preference that we use that money strictly for the things that were that were of um, urgency. I would say this is an urgent matter. Yes. Water leaks in. I would just amend the motion to say that if there are insufficient funds or if it is not deemed appropriate that we use existing Lake Mac funds for or the I, balance or before we do that I would I would say there are other more appropriate things like the like Nugent funds that were not you you know that are remaining just that's okay then we'll just amend it to say if available building funds are insufficient yeah other sources will be used. Okay, that should not be the case, but yes, for this right. amount, there, there should be. There should be. So, one second. Second. Okay. second motion. Any further discussion? Yeah. All in favor? Thank you. And we'll have a big night talk another time. <laughs> I had to get those few meetings again. Well, I think it's fun. Yeah, right. Yeah, but, 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 okay, but, so making nice sure you've got that. Okay, that's good. And then one last quick update about um, another long-running, uh, long-standing, unresolved issue from the completion of the building was that the front doors and the doors to this meeting room and the doors to the smaller meeting room off of the lobby were all meant, they are wired to be accessible after hours that you would be able to come in having made a reservation with a card or a fob, swipe yourself into the room that you have reserved and have your, have your meeting or your event. Um, however, this has all been in, sort of snarled up in um, 
the town's larger effort to have a, a fiber optic network that links all the town buildings together, um, which I don't, I don't fully understand the logistics of this and what it entails, but one thing that it does entail is that there's some sort of equipment room located off-site, not in any of the town buildings, I'm not sure why, but there is, a, um, there is going to be a space that was initially going to be in the back of the Target at, down at the Hampshire Mall. I don't know why. Um, and so now that was that hung, they were hung up on that for a long period of time, as I understand it. They've now found a new location for this, which is in the home, what is it, the home? Home style, home suite. Why would it not be in a I don't know. Is this a Homewood Suites. This has been four, so, so our handicap door is not, it's, you can't press the button and use it. It's been four years. This has been four years. Coming up on four years, yes. So this is a done deal, that they're, they're going to do this, which... Well, it's been a done deal for four years. I, I, don't work for the, <laughs> I don't work for the fire department, so I can't say. This is this is not my not my deal, but uh, but this is the, the latest update that, that we've gotten, is that they are moving forward, the, the equipment is being installed. The equipment that they need to provide the access to the buildings is installed at the North Hadley Fire Station and that they are waiting for the contractor who is responsible for the actual kind of final activation of the equipment here to get back in the loop and, and finish it off. So that is what I have been told and, and oftentimes you know, we come to these meetings and there will be months and months where there is this item just says no update. And so this was a pleasant surprise to see that there had been some movement um, and that's all I can say. I can only report what I've been told but I'm hopeful that we are actually going to have a functional system soon. So maybe we can revisit this in July and see what progress they've made. Because I worry about, and I understand the laws can be a little vague to say the least, but you know, as somebody who's a public school teacher, I know how I have to serve some of my students. I know there's some special ed teachers in this room that you're aware of how you have to serve students with different needs. Um, and I know it's really upsetting to some members of the town who don't feel that there's any movement on this and there's not easy access into the library. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and it, it's, it's, been, it's been actually very painful um, for that reason because we do, we have periodically received some very upset um, you know, comments about the situation um, and try as we might, we have not been able to find a workaround. We've not been able to, again, I'm not an electrical engineer. Nobody sitting around this table is in a capacity. We've only been able to rely on the people that have been working on this project and the other people in town who are involved in the decision making for this larger project to wire together all of the buildings. Um, and so we've been dependent on, you know, on that project, which was put in place without really any consultation to the library, um, and we've just sort of been held hostage by so, the slow progress of it. You know, I'm kind of fascinated because the senior center. I guess maybe it's because they have those the sliding, sliding doors, doors yeah. but yeah. they don't operate. I mean, I guess I don't know electronics either. Do they not operate on the same? Well, I they're not going to have access. Go up to it, they'll move. The difference here is that their, their doors are not going to be, as far as I know, they're not going to have access. Oh, they're not going to be, access. okay, they're not going to have it. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I, but the last I heard, I didn't think that they were, they were part gotcha. of that. We, we may we're, be one of the only buildings that allows that for the public. Where has the buck stopped? <clears throat> uh, the, buck is, the buck is moving along at a rapid clip. I don't think it's, I don't think it's stopped yet. I don't think it's stopped anywhere. <laughs> So, so who who is the, who is the delay? I guess that's what I'm asking. What? Again, I couldn't I could not tell you because again, this is a this is a for, from my point of view, it is a black box that I don't know what goes on in it. We were we were not consulted when this was, was determined. This plan was developed. I I think the easy the short answer is it's coming through the fire department. Mike Spanknebel is in charge of the project. So he's been, he's the one in the know about how it's working. And the whole network and all the wiring and where that goes. I will tell you um, that there's one person that I know who is happy to volunteer to do some micro electrical work 
to just get that switch working. So you push the button and it would open the door. So just in case if this is delayed. Yeah, I, yeah, this is one of those things that I don't, I just don't know what to say because I know that um, while we are not under warranty per se with the building, since some of this work has never been completed, I don't want to void a warranty that may still, we may still be entitled to when um, Sabula comes in to complete the work. I'm not sure when the clock starts. I don't see how we could be on, under a warranty for equipment that never, that never worked. So if the, if the equipment is not going to be under warranty until day one when it's powered on, then I don't want to, I don't want to mess anything up by doing end runs around it. We've already done some stuff that we should never have had to do, like drill holes in the panic bars to hold them open. The only way that those doors can be held open is by, is by us drilling a hole in the panic bar and sticking uh, you know, a cotter pin in it to hold it open. That's how, that's how ridiculous the situation has been. That's what we've been doing every day for four years. And so um, I, I'm very hesitant to go that route. And, uh, and, and my, my reason for feeling like it's okay to be hesitant about that is because we have already gone through the, um, we've, we've shared the actual code for, you know, accessibility with the town as far as what is required and the way we understand it as long as those buttons are not displaying that there's something that you can push there that doesn't work in the same way that if you put up an exit sign there by a door that was nailed shut that would be a problem but if the door is nailed shut and you've covered over the exit sign you know that do you understand what i'm saying like you because you, you don't want to send someone to 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 try to operate something that doesn't work so it's legal so is what you're saying. The door itself is legal as it stands. It may not be convenient, but it is, it is up to code. The issue would be, as I understand it, or is having a sign that says, this door is powered and accessible, push the button, but it doesn't work. So that's why we've covered over the buttons until such time as the system can operate. So a person with a disability has to find a way to push the door open and get through. They do, however, they have to do that with every other door that is not equipped with an operating um, door opener, which is essentially all of them except for that one. So if you take my meaning, like these doors here, for instance, don't open automatically, um, but they are up to code as far as the clearance goes <clears throat> and the weight, the weight of the doors. The interior lobby door will not have, unless we decide to spend the money to activate that the interior lobby door does not now have the capacity for an automatic opener right. I mean, the door that gets you into the correct lobby itself correct which is just like these it's configured just like these it's just a wooden double door now it, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, just because something is legally right doesn't necessarily mean that correct. it's it's what we should it's do. ethically but as the building was designed, it did not have those as part of the of the, the equipment for the building. If we decide that we want to go that route because we feel like it's appropriate to do so, there's nothing stopping us from doing that aside from the cost of doing it. I'm a little bit more tuned to it because I have a son-in-law who's, who's wheelchair bound and yeah. has to deal with those things. And Absolutely. So he's learned over the past. It's really been frustrating. Frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, word. Yes. He's and made me aware. I wouldn't ordinarily yeah. be aware, but I've become aware to me. Yeah. And I, I think it's something that we probably, you know, periodically need to be reviewing for the building as a whole in terms of accessibility, just continually doing a sort of audit of the building to see what can be improved for where we are current, you know, in current time, what are our expectations, what is best practice. It's something that, that should be ongoing. I just wonder how the select board <coughs> made their choice of who our liaison is yet? Yes, it's Amy Parsons. Because I just feel that <coughs> there are some things we're hearing that we've been talking about now, like this, for four years, and the cleaning issues. Like, we need a representative from the select board. We, we had one. They didn't necessarily contact us or work with us, um, you know, in the past. Like, 
years ago. Oh, we had people that didn't like. But the whole idea of the select board having having liaisons to the committees is that I think that instead of spending every meeting, like we as trustees need to speak up. Like Patrick can speak up to departments, but we as trustees have some, I think, like ethical <laughs> obligation to make sure that the select board knows what what our issues are at the library and whether they're being addressed or not. Um, I thought there was a person assigned, a select person assigned to be the leader. Amy Parsons. There is, there, we just got a new one, that's Amy Parsons. It had been Jane Nevin Smith last year, it's Amy Parsons this year. But they don't, yeah. like, oh, this. there's no systematic contact. Like, in the past, when I was chair years ago, I couldn't, when we were building the library, I couldn't even get hold of our contact at the time. They didn't return calls, they wouldn't, and we were trying to build the library. And I just think it's really important that the select board stay in tune with the, the folks that they, the different departments that they're in charge of, even if it's, you know, getting an email from us, or like, we, we need some voice at the table. Um, for issues that are, are important to us because Should we say that? as a trustee, I feel like my job is to, like Patrick works with the other department chairs, but our job is to advocate when things aren't working. And I feel like if we had a reliable contact, I'm not saying Amy might be wonderful, I'm not like, this is not a judgment, I'm, I'm kind of glad we have someone new and like, Jane was here for our um, last event, but I think that we need to speak out about things that we are struggling with. Um, I will yeah. send an email to Amy. I will copy the chair. I will include the minutes from the last two meetings and links to the YouTube videos of our meetings and also outline these issues that are long standing. I think, or and maybe we invite her to a meeting with like, where we bring up those the issue. You know, we key up. We'll start. Issues. We'll start here, and I will extend an invitation, so she can hear from us. And because to be fair to Amy, yeah. like they they may be assigned three or four different departments, and reading through minutes and figuring out. I mean, it's important to have them. But like, you know, I think it's great that you're gonna highlight things because I think that, you know, finding out what's been a source of frustration for a board isn't that. I will tell her which, at which point in the video to listen to the... <laughs> I think the issue is that there's not really, there's not really, I mean, the fact that there is a liaison system is something. That there is someone assigned to, to take responsibility for it. But unfortunately, there's not really more that I'm aware of, of a, system to make that make the connections between the departments and the liaisons i think and rather than you know rather than wading in and saying like well there should be a system in place i think it probably would just be more effective to put a system in place that works for us which would be to say we would love to meet with the liaison whoever the liaison may be like what what on whatever timetable we think is most most appropriate it could be every two months it could be quarterly it could be you know something that's reasonable that doesn't put an undue burden on whoever it is because they have a lot on their plates and it is a volunteer mm -hmm. position. But I think, I think just for our, to, to set our own expectations of what, um, I think it would just be good to, to go to them with something like that. It's just a, you know, what can we expect? How often can we hear from you? Can we sit down and talk with you, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, face, face to face? Over the last couple of years, Jane, well, over the last year, Jane has been our uh, liaison on the climate change committee and she's been wonderful about attending most of the meetings. She hasn't attended 100%, but almost. Mm -hmm. So it was great to have that kind of support behind us. Sure. Do okay. you know who the new chair is for this round with the select board? Molly. Molly's chair. Okay. Moving on? Yeah. Okay. Um, the annual director review process, I have collated and distributed a summary of staff responses to the staff members and asked if I could please hear from them 
by the end of this week if any changes are needed in case I have misrepresented or not included something or um, not provided the level of anonymity that I try very hard to incorporate this. Once I have approval to share the results of the survey that they were asked to complete, that in addition to Patrick's document describing the goals that we had for this year and his narrative relative to each of those, then I will send board members a link to the survey, online survey that I created um, for you to complete. And I really think that we only have four people around the table and I'm not sure how, since Jack's only been here since January, February, um, the idea will be you can participate to the extent that you feel comfortable. Everything has a not applicable, I don't know. Um, I will say that um, Jessica Kem, who had been on the board, has agreed to participate in this part of the evaluation because she has the exper relative experience over the period of time and um, it would be better to have more participants than fewer. So she has agreed to do that. So you will hear more and I am happy to share the information with you so you can see what is there um, because that in turn will play into setting goals for FY25 and it will be helpful for you to see all of those things in addition to the trustee evaluation. And Patrick will also complete the same form that the trustees complete, so we will have comparisons. And I will just note, using the same staff data collection form that we used last year was really a wonderful thing to see how things changed or um, what needs more work, but it was enormously helpful to have that. Okay. Uh, question. When does fiscal year 25 start? In this July. Fiscal year's one, right, just like at the university, July 1 through June 30. Um, I think we've already talked about lead certification, unless there's anything more you want to add, Jack? There, there is more to okay. add because it also might require a vote here on moving things forward. So LEAD stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. I have the answer now. And the MBLC? The Mass Board of Library Commissioners, from whom we got construction grant money. Uh, offers additional grant money if you achieve LEED certification. That was always one of the goals. So there's different hierarchies of certification. So for certified, it would be $100,000 back to the library. Uh, for silver level, it be a little bit more. For gold, a little bit more. For platinum, it would be 136000 would be the top. But it takes quite a bit to actually um, achieve the platinum level. So at the Senior Center, um, Phil O'Brien points out he was one of the architects, um, is not a lead building. So interesting on that. Uh, there was a sense of waiting and seeing what would happen with the solar because that could increase our level and bring us up that little hierarchy. Uh, but knowing that that's on hold for a number of reasons, I mean, it may happen, it may not. Um, depending on what happens with somebody in town. What Phil recommends is, um, he's saying, I'm not aware of a time period in which you need to submit the LEED certification, but sooner is probably better. Uh, the MBLC would also like to get to that point so they can adjust your grant amount, and they would obviously like to be able to plan for the expenditure. So Phil is recommending that we go for it, that we move forward with LEED certification. 
and it seems to make sense. Is it the case that you would anticipate that we meet the minimum threshold? But we'll see. It all depends. So there is a rubric, if you will, a set of criteria, and you know where do you get your points and all of that. But he believes that we would achieve um, the basic lead certification um, for that hundred thousand dollar minimum grant. Anybody want to explain what lead certification is to me? So again, that whole idea of being sort of forward-looking leadership and energy and environmental design. So this building was really designed with that in mind, uh, with a little extra insulation in places and other things, and you know even some of the things like what you were sharing earlier about the recycling. I think those would be points that count toward our score. Right. I don't. I don't actually know that those are points. Those are just some sort of. Requirements because we asked about that. We said, well, could we just not do that because we don't have a waste stream figured out? And they said, no, it's actually a prerequisite. Okay. It's not really a point thing. But even like the shades on the windows are designed to minimize light, like all the kind of design of the building to minimize energy usage. The heating use, system, right. heating and cooling, I believe. That's all electric, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It seems to me that it's probably even not worth the wait for the thirty-six thousand. Like, it seems like getting in on a hundred thousand while they're getting it out is probably the smartest. I kind of agree the with that. Yeah. Yeah. So I am not a lead expert, but if you have this opportunity that we can go after now right. Right. as a library, as a community, it just seems to make sense to email Phil and say, "Help us move forward." So we have to pay though, right? Well, you are more of an expert on that than I am. Well, there's a question. There's a question in my mind, and we'll have to ask Phil this because I don't know if we already paid them the consulting fees for lead, or if this is something that would be invoiced later. I don't know the answer to that question. But and it was not. So one of the things that um, that is interesting to me is that I was under the impression, perhaps mistakenly that it was not a foregone conclusion that we would qualify for LEED without the solar panels. I, I was under the impression that if, without those panels that we were like very close to the line. And so that's kind of like why we were not rushing to, to go through this only to find out that we didn't qualify. And I don't know if by not qualifying, you're able to then try to be recertified once you've gotten more points by doing something that you, you should have done. I don't really know how that part works. And maybe it's changed. Yeah. But I, yeah. I had the same understanding he did. And, and I have no fact behind it. I just remember hearing that. Like, I don't have any, it's not like I remember somebody specifically telling me in some. Well, there, was, there were some, you know, there were some emails about this at the time. And it, it, to me, again, I'm not have them in front of me, but my, my impression was that we were, it was not, they, they don't, it's sort of like when you, it's, you are applying for a grant. It's like you're applying for a grant. You're applying for the certification and there are people that review the thing and just because you think that you've done something doesn't necessarily mean that you've done it correctly or that they're going to give you the point. You know, there are certain things that maybe, you know, they give you more points or less points. Like, I mean, I'm not, I don't know lead, but there are some things that seems, it seems like it's not so cut and dry that you've just checked the box so you know you're going to get these points. So there's, there's some like open question about like, so the what's process. the best way to move this forward? Is Again, I, I, would, I would listen to Phil. If Phil is saying there's, this is the way to go, then I would say we follow Phil's lead and, and do what he's saying. But some of the questions that you're asking are good ones. Do we have to pay? Are we going to have to pay for the lead engineer to, to, to go forward with this? Is that something we've already paid for? If we've already paid for it, we might as well do it. So is this something you feel comfortable um, contacting Phil and asking these questions, or is this something that you'd like me to move forward? Either way, I mean, uh, you see, I can do it in CCU, or you can write it in CC me. But if just you could do it, yeah, sure. It's the last week of school. I will have to do it. So again, paying the consultant fee, the solar, yes, no. Uh, yeah, and I'm not sure if Phil is necessarily saying it's a lock. We'll get it, but um, it's. Definitely worth pursuing. It's worth asking the question. Yes. Okay. Anything more on the subject or do we move on to strategic planning? So we don't have a report right now except that the staff 
has done the same um, SWAT, yeah, the solar SWAT exercise that we have. Um, Patrick and I are working. You'll hear more. I don't want to take too much time this meeting. I'll wait till we have a, but basically looking to do a five-year strategic plan for the library. Patrick and I are going to meet, and then we'll have a report next month about the next steps we'll take. And what's the translation on SWAT? So, they so the library system. <laughs> I feel like Patrick and I have like a different feeling about it. The libraries, the library wants to use SOAR as an acronym rather than SWAT when you go through what I've traditionally run as a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Like, so that's what you go through. What are the strengths of the library? What are the weaknesses? What are the opportunities we have? What are the threats? SOAR is very similar. Um, I think I think the difference in the, the the more I thought about it because I, I had the same feeling of kind of like this is kind of goofy like, but but I think I think that when you sit down around I'm just thinking in terms of organizations that I have other libraries that I've worked in with bigger staffs, maybe staffs that are less cohesive, less happy. There's a potential to get into one of these sorts of things and do a lot of. Um, have there be a lot of group therapy about things, grievances in the things that are in the past and not, the SOAR seems to be about looking more towards the future of the organization and not so much thinking about what has gone wrong in the past. That's my impression about it. There's a lot more positivity in about, in about opportunity as opposed to like what's broken. I'm sorry, what does SOAR stand? We heard SWAT. It's what strengths, is opportunities. <laughs> You would ask that. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I, I just can't remember off the top of my head. I'm but actually um, resources. It was resources. a new marketing Assets. firm that got extra money for, for designing up with that one. Just <laughs> sore. Oh, so I can look it up on my phone. What? What? It's kind of, I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's not. Like, I, you think of a cat and SWAT. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and We've been swats of it around forever. So, I, people so, have too much time on their hands. So, <laughs> probably. So anyway, Patrick has run one with the staff. We ran a, a big open one. We're going to have some, uh, Patrick and I are gonna meet. We're gonna establish a plan to propose to all of you of how to move forward. Mm -hmm. So I don't wanna take up too much time today. You'll hear from us next month. Okay. Okay, sorry, strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results. There you go. Thank goodness. Mm. That is nicer than threats. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I just when I was at face it was a thing. thing. I don't know. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Board organ reorganization and meeting calendar. We need to elect officers, so I can tell town hall who is in what position, where, and. So I will, I'm not sure if it's time to make yes, a motion. Yes, it is. Okay. So <laughs> I'll make a motion for Lynn as the chair and Joanne as vice chair. Sure. And how are we going to do this secretarial role coming up? And Susan is clerk. Susan, Susan is clerk? Yes. Okay. I didn't know if we would alternate. She offered okay. to be interpreted. Bless you. Yes. <laughs> Are there, is there a fourth? No. Okay. We only have the third. So that's what I put forth with this motion. I will second the motion. Is there any discussion or are there any other volunteers? <laughs> Jackie Dunn did show the secretary's job. I'd be willing to if. Well, we if you're not around sometime or. Okay. You. If Susan is that officially, and if you two want to negotiate, I'll be the alternate <laughs> clerk or secretary. You may do vice that. clerk. Vice <laughs> clerk. Vice <laughs> clerk. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> so like Put that the on. Like There's the top. <laughs> yeah. There's the right at the top. <laughs> yes. Okay. I seconded. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Okay. Um, the library trustees have historically met on the second Tuesdays at 7 p.m. If that fits everyone's calendar, then I propose that we continue to do so. If it doesn't, 
the fit your calendar on a regular basis, then we'll find something else. Second Tuesdays of each month. Yes, that's it for you. I, I mean, the summer is a little bit more iffy for me. I'm away a fair amount in the summer. Well, the good months. news is we now have enough people I who know. can still have a quorum <laughs> if somebody's not here. Well, it's all multiples of three, right? Yeah. Isn't that the, the way the, tri and the library board sort of demands? No. Multiples of three? Yes, they say multiples. Okay. What it should be is three or any odd number more, but that's not what they did. Okay. Go figure. Okay, then for all intended and purposes, we will continue to do second Tuesdays. Is there any other business? How do you know? Who is that? Not too bad. Considering we have a fairly full agenda. If there's nothing else, I would be happy to entertain a motion to adjourn. Do I make a motion to adjourn? You can just make so many. So many. All in favor. Okay. Thank you very much.